Um, it's, it's nice to be uh, reunited with my old friend Campbell. Um, we uh, worked together for several years, but we haven't seen each other in a while, so it's really a pleasure to be back here with him, but also to meet his colleagues and, and students, and it gives me a good feeling to know that he has so many people around him to talk to. Um, I, wanted to, I wanted to start by telling, just telling you um, a little bit about the, the poet Robert Creeley, you may know. He, um, he spent a lot of time in Auckland. He's, um, he's uh, part of the Black Mountain School of, of Poets in the U.S., uh, uh, together with Charles Olson, uh, Zukowski, a number of others. And he came here first in 74, and then he returned for a year at the University of Auckland in 1995. Uh, and I was reminded him, of him on my first uh, morning here. I was in the park, uh, or rather on your campus, and a, a dog came up and greeted me. And I was reminded that the poem that he wrote in 95 while he was here was called The Dogs of Auckland. And uh, it was a poem about being a, an American who was disoriented by the city uh, until gradually he began to commune with these dogs uh, around the city. Uh, and there's a wonderful moment uh, in it when he's involved in a sort of what I would say almost a kind of interspecies study uh, in which he says, I am the dog of Auckland. Um, and uh, I, certainly, uh, I certainly have felt like the dog of Auckland most mornings uh, since I've arrived here. Uh, but nonetheless, I, 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 I take his point that, um, you know, there is, uh, the dog is the animal um, that I am to follow, as Derrida might say. So I start this talk thinking about study, uh, and I hope that I will get back to that talk of study uh, and about what uh, Fred Moten and I mean when we speak about study. But uh, I have to warn you that I don't have much time, and I have some, um, some ways to go before I get there. So if we don't get back to study, uh, maybe we can talk about it um, in the question and answer period. Where I'd like to start, actually, is in uh, Ferguson. Uh, in the United States, a place that has been in the news for you, uh, as for us, I'm sure. Uh, Ferguson is the scene of a particularly notorious uh, police killing um, of an uh, unarmed African-American youth uh, called Michael Brown. Are, are you vaguely familiar with that? I think it seems like it was a fairly global story, uh, and I'm sure that it has its parallels uh, here in Auckland. Now, that story has been explained in a number of different ways, and uh, it's been analyzed quite a bit. Uh, it spawned a very large protest movement, a very impressive protest movement that's gone on longer in the United States than almost any protest movements going all the way back to the uh, Montgomery bus boycott. So it's a very impressive movement that was in some ways unanticipated, but maybe, uh, maybe that's uh, something that uh, needs to be learned, that those movements are often quite unanticipated. Now there's a number of ways we could look at uh, Ferguson, as I say, and the way that I'm going to look at it in the brief time that I have here is <clears throat> perhaps a little bit different than how it's been uh, generally portrayed. Of course, on the one hand, it's been, uh, it's been analyzed as part of a long history, and it certainly is part of a long history uh, in the United States of um, extra state violence and state violence um, against uh, black populations, principally, but also Latino and Aboriginal populations in, in the US, and part of a long history, history of settler colonialism um, that itself also was part of a, a kind of slave colonial capitalism. And it's certainly true that it has to be taken in that frame. Um, but it also is, uh, in a sense, something new. Uh, not just in the way that it spawned the movement, but also I would say in what it might rep represent um, as a change in the forces of antagonism in the United States. It's been pointed out, for instance, that the police have become more militarized and that they've been sold a lot of military equipment. Today, as you know, especially if you're, if you're working in, in, uh, in an American context, as I know a couple of you are, um, even universities have SWAT teams um, there are uh, armored vehicles uh, in many school districts now, um, and uh, there have been a number of stories of, uh, of uh, rocket launchers and other things that have fallen into the hands of uh, police officers. So there certainly is a, a militarization going on, but 
that's always going on to some extent in the United States. It's part of a long history of uh, going back to the Patty Rollers, the Klan, etc., of, uh, of a armed white citizenry uh, combining with a with a with a state force. But there is something that is new, even statistically. Uh, last year, the number of uh, deadly killings of 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 so-called felons was was up again in the United States, up to over 400, near 450. Uh, killings. At the same time, um, the murder rate in the United States is at a 20-year low, uh, as is the rate of death of police officers. So we see these things pulling away, increase the amount of use of deadly force uh, in communities at the same time that there is uh, manifestly less violence in those communities by, uh, by most accounts. So there is something going on. It's not surprising people have tried to talk about it. And of course, the most famous way that it's been spoken about is, uh, is through the, the campaign called uh, Black Lives Matter, which you may have seen as a kind of hashtag. And it was a, a grassroots effort to, um, to mobilize uh, people around um, a sense of the dignity of human life. Um, you know, Fred and I have, uh, without disparaging that campaign in any way, have have been asked a lot about that, and and pretty consistently, um, I've I've tried to say, I think he has tried to say in his way too, that there there is a problem with the notion of Black Lives Matter. Uh, it is a it is an appeal to a, a certain kind of individual rights, which um, have always existed, um, essentially against uh, the the actual conditions of of black people in the United States, Aboriginal people, etc. It's part of a long history of a kind of liberalism that only, only exists, um, uh, I would say, um, uh, by feeding off of uh, the denial of, of such rights to others. So there's something contradictory um, in, in Black Lives Matters. Uh, on the other hand, uh, black life matters, or we might even say black life is a mattering. And it's been a mattering recently that has had, a, I think, a new uh, new form of opposition in it that's quite important. So the reason that I'm starting here in Ferguson is that the, in the brief time I have, I want to make a, uh, an argument to you, that you uh, to, for us to, to speculate with, uh, which goes something like this, that <clears throat> uh, today you can't really understand the university um, in its most generalized form uh, without understanding uh, logistics. And you can't really understand uh, logistics without understanding race and ultimately what Fred and I would call blackness. Um, that's the argument of the talk, how far into it and how much I can uh, persuade you in the time I have remains to be seen. Um, but I want to start by suggesting to you that what we're seeing in Ferguson um, might be worth reminding ourselves was a, a case in which um, jaywalking was punishable by death. Um, and I'd say that that's not entirely incidental, even if I have to admit it's also partly symbolic. Um, some of you may know the history of jaywalking, but it's an interesting uh, history. I don't know if they use that term in New Zealand. Do you use the term jaywalking? Um, you know, it's part of a transition from um, colonial capitalism, from colonial capitalism to industrial capitalism in the United States. A J was... Uh, was a, was a country bumpkin, a rube, uh, someone who walked down the street because uh, he or she didn't know better. Uh, and as a result, there was a campaign, a public campaign, but backed by the emerging automobile industry uh, to get people not to walk down the middle of the street uh, because there was the beginning of a, you know, a, a flow of traffic, the beginning of uh, the streets becoming uh, part of a set of grids that would um, underpin much of industrial capitalism. So that, uh, that jaywalking had a significance um, in the period of uh, transition. Uh, and I'd say that, in a sense, that kind of travel, that, uh, that motif of travel, uh, is becoming significant again uh, in this period of um, what I'm going to call uh, logistical uh, capitalism. So how can we get to the point where jaywalking was punishable uh, by death? Well, of course, we know all the reasons that um, 
that this, this kind of violence persists in the United States. And yet, nonetheless, I do think there's something here that's worth us thinking about, uh, maybe in a new frame, without imagining that those other things necessarily go away. And what I'm thinking about in particular is that there's a transition that goes on from industrial capitalism to um, what I'm calling logistical capitalism, which, uh, which has a figure also, uh, maybe not the Jay Walker, but maybe the traveling salesman. And the traveling salesman is an interesting figure in a transition from uh, an industrial capitalism, particularly in the United States, to, to, to something beyond that, something that I might like to call logistical capitalism. Uh, this traveling salesman is interesting because, uh, first of all, there are a whole number of jokes associated with the, the traveling salesman, which have very much to do with the opening up of the areas of social reproduction to, to direct monetarization and, and to direct labor. Um, they're normally, normally portrayed as these moments in which uh, a traveling salesman meets, um, meets a, a girl or a woman on a farm somewhere who's still very much within the sphere of a kind of settler colonialism, which she's either working on the farm or she's working in the, the private sphere of the home, etc. And this is the kind of uh, root of waking of another world in which um, uh, some sort of innocence is lost and some kind of um, new, new form of capitalism invades uh, literally into this, this settler uh, condition. But there's another aspect to the traveling salesman, and, and, that's, and that's what sometimes called the traveling salesman problem. Um, which you may know if you've, uh, if you've had the misfortune to study too much logistics, uh, or indeed um, get familiar with uh, any numbers of uh, any number of operations management as well. Because the traveling salesman problem is a is a is a basic name for the problem of how to have an efficient movement uh, of goods and people, uh, a classic uh, logistics problem. That traveling salesman figure, I would suggest, has gradually morphed today into the figure that I, I think is the figure of domination today, and that is the consultant. The consultant today is the, the bearer of the algorithm. Um, and as the consultant moves, the algorithm moves with that consultant. And that consultant, in turn, um, produces and reproduces a certain new set of, of class relations. What do I mean by that? Well, in order to, to say a bit more about that and why it's important for the university, um, I have to say two things about, I think, what's hap changing in the uh, economy and what has changed. Um, and I'll have to do that briefly. One is there's a kind of objective way in which certainly something like the American economy has become more logistical. Um, so for instance, in the United States, the, the vast majority of, of states in the United States, the, the uh, the biggest job is trucking. So you're most likely to have a job as a trucker. Uh, the second biggest job in most states is secretary, and the third is programmer. Now, of course, these categories aren't very good. Um, but even given the problems of the category of trucking, which includes all kinds of delivery, um, there's a way in which the American economy has a, a good deal of logistics in it, and behind that, a good deal of the algorithm. And when that is coupled and doubled as it is with the financialization of the economy, something I believe uh, Campbell will speak more about, um, we can get the sense of why a consultant might be the kind of figure of domination today in the same way that I would argue that in industrial capitalism, the citizen was the figure of domination. And prior to him, the settler was the figure of domination in colonial capitalism. So this consultant, I think, um, has a lot to answer for, but he's partly individually responsible for this. Partly what has happened, um, I think, requires a slight revision of our history of financialization, which I, I offer uh, a little bit tentatively, given the, uh, the expert next to me on this matter. But um, we have a tendency to think of financialization as having coming into the firm and been part of what breaks up the firm, reorganizes the firm. But in a way, I think that finance the road for finance is, in fact, prepared through a much more obscure um, set of processes that take place in business and that are particularly located in operations management. Um, are there any operations management professors in here? Because it could be trouble for me, but I'm nonetheless going to plow ahead. Well, operations management, uh, you know, there's a certain moment in operations management 
characterized by the Japanese term kaizen, in which uh, I would say a certain change happens in the, in the, in the labor process. And uh, there's a shift in focus uh, in which there's a, a new attention to, to the, the continuous improvement of the line. There's a new attention to, now this is always there, of course, there's always competition, there's always a, a improvement, but there's a new attention, there's a new intensification in how the line moves, how it operates, uh, and, and what it's capable of doing. Now this, this coincides with a number of important things, including the coming together of operations management and, and logistics, because it's all happening around the same time. But this attention to the continuous improvement of the line begins to shift focus away from products and onto the, the notion of, of how people can do things. And this eventually will lead to, um, to, to this confusion we have now where, uh, where it's quite common to, to, to imagine that anybody can run any kind of business because they, they have an ability to improve it. But this starts in a very specific way, I would argue, with Kaizen. Uh, and it has very much to do with beginning to think about moving away from human resources, it's not the people who are important, moving away from, from accounting and engineering, it's not the stuff that's important. The line itself becomes important. But as this line is becoming more important, it's also exploding. It's exploding firstly because uh, logistics theorists and, and operations management people have begun to see that there's a, there's a, there's a complete line that goes in and out of the factory door and continues in both directions into society and into nature. And that line is beginning to uh, be extended. It's all along it, it's being subjected to this continuous improvement and to this uh, imperative to, to show new ways in which essentially um, one can speculate on the line. And it's that speculation on the line and what the line can do that uh, invites uh, finance, in my view, in the, at the end of the 1970s, beginning of the 80s. Now, why do I go through all that, and, and what's the relation of, of that to, to the university or to what we're trying to do here? Well, what I'm suggesting, of course, is that the thing that I've been describing is, is essentially what's sometimes called the social factory, um, the way in which the assembly now, line now weaves its way through society as a whole and is no longer confined to individual firms, individual factories, etc. But more importantly, that, that, that social factory puts so much pressure on us because it's not just a matter of us now being responsible for connecting that line. And it's not just a matter that that line, the assembly line itself, is essentially always unfinished now, which puts a tremendous amount of pressure on us. But it's also that we are not just responsible for connecting we're not just responsible for, for linking it uh, to the next person or the next thing. Um, we're responsible for improving it. So you can't just pass an email along. You have to pass it along with a comment. <laughs> um, so there's tremendous pressure that comes from this Kaizen being spread through society in this way, and also tremendous uncertainty because we never know uh, when we're done, and because we are never done. And one of the things that the consultant has produced to the algorithm is a notion that the labor process is forever unfinished, uh, and that the assembly line is forever unfinished, even as it weaves throughout. Now, that notion of, of work that's always unfinished, of uh, the danger of never doing enough, of course, is is new to some of us, but it certainly isn't new to some of the figures that, um, that have, you know, that sit at the, the background of this talk. And particularly, it, it's not new to the indentured worker, to the slave, to the migrant, that there should be no end um, to the labor process and no notion of when it's ever complete. But more importantly, what logistics asks of us, what logistical capitalism asks of us, is not that we continuously improve alone or connect alone, but also that we, 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 we provide and we also demand complete and absolute access. Complete and absolute access. Complete and absolute access to ourselves and that we demand of others that kind of access. That, more than anything else, is for me the reason that the figures who haunted uh, in, their, in their struggles for liberation, earlier forms of capitalism return with such a vengeance today because the, the ultimate figure both of 
liberation from this access and of the ultimate and of, of complete access itself uh, was the African slave. And not just the African slave, but anyone who crossed the path of that particularly brutal moment from Aboriginals who were enslaved uh, to uh, Asians who were indentured, etc. That notion of access, which is what logistics precisely demands of all of us again, uh, is in that sense a very old, um, a very old uh, form of exploitation and a very old form of domination. To me, jaywalking today is a form of sabotage. And in that sense, um, I'm not surprised that these forms of dissent are meeting with the most brutal uh, kinds of uh, responses from the state. Of course, that's all the more reason um, to struggle against that state. And um, I think that we're seeing that in places like Ferguson. But nonetheless, I would say that the kind of capitalism we're in now, one in which what's demanded of us is not only total connectivity, total flexibility, total translatability, um, but also total access to ourselves at every level, intellectual, emotional, uh, relational, etc., cetera, um, is something that um, has long been resisted and resisted most by those uh, who have most been, uh, most been exploited and uh, dominated by it. And it's for that reason that I think the way that we might try to understand the university today is by trying to get a sense of uh, where it sits within this logistical capitalism. And I think we can maybe, maybe reach some interesting um, observations about the university doing it that way. Now, I'm aware that the university on the one hand, and I've spoken about this and I've also heard some really good stuff um, this week about it, needs to be understood still, and I, I don't deny this, you know, as, as Palancis might say, as a kind of condensation of forces, and that um, in addition to that, there is an ongoing class struggle in the university. Um, but I wanted actually to focus on that other aspect of the university that maybe um, is slightly uh, less fashionable, um, and, and that's its, its role in, in domination, in what Althusser would say, called domination. I'm going to read you a very short quote from Althusser, just to set up this last part of my, um, my talk to you. Thank you. He says, um, he's talking about schools, and he says, uh, what everybody also knows, however, that is, what nobody uh, cares to know, is that alongside these techniques, reading, writing, arithmetic, and this learning, elements of scientific and literary culture that function as know-how, alongside but also in the process of acquiring these techniques and this learning, people also learn at school the rules of good behavior, that is, the proprieties to be observed by every agent in the division of labor. Depending on the post, he is destined to hold in it. These are rules of professional ethics and professional conscience, that is, to put it plainly, rules of respect for the social and technical division of labor. And in the final analysis, the rules of the order established by class domination. People also learn to speak proper French at school, to write properly, which, is in, fa which in fact means for future capitalists and their underlings, to order workers around properly, which in fact means the ideal case, to talk properly to them so as to intimidate them or cajole them, in short, to con them. The literary curricula in secondary and higher education serve that end, among others. Put this in, a more scientific, in more scientific terms, we shall say that the reproduction of labor power requires not only the qualifications be reproduced, but the submissions to the, to the rules of respect for the established order be reproduced at the same time. This means for the workers, reproduction of labor power, submission to the dominant ideology, and for the agents of exploitation and repression, reproduction of its capacity to handle the dominant ideology properly so as to ensure the dominant, domination of the dominant class verbally. So with that in mind, with the, in mind that the university, in addition to being uh, something that I think has been, that's been nicely covered at moments, a place of class struggle, a place where a lot of labor happens. Um, it is also remains a place of uh, where domination is um, reproduced. And it's interesting to think about what domination might look like for logistical capitalism. 
And I've been trying to think about this in the context of my own university, uh, which Campbell mentioned is Singapore Management University, which is in a sense quite a technical university, very concerned with business, very concerned with law, very concerned with accounting, economics, etc. And yet, um, it's in recent in recent uh, years, its emphasis has all been in these directions, which make no sense on the surface that way. So, for instance. Uh, they have, uh, they've, they've tried to reach 100% of their undergraduates uh, going overseas at some point. They've created all kinds of creative lab spaces for these undergraduates who have no obvious interest uh, in sitting in these spaces and, and playing on these bean bags. They've created all these spaces for them. And then most remarkably recently, they created um, what Althusser calls a, a literary uh, culture, they've created a kind of humanities. And in fact, that's the reason I'm there. Um, and I would suggest that all of those things have to do with um, forms of domination, uh, which are taking the form increasingly of, of demanding, as well as providing access. And that this increased um, attention to travel, this increased attention to um, study that never ends and has no uh, separation from, from the life of uh, a student on a beanbag chair. And indeed, this humanities curriculum, which is, does what the humanities curriculum has always done since, um, since the time of, of Kant, at least, uh, which is re reproduce a, a, a verbal domination, as, as um, Althusser would say, that this, these are all part of um, of new forms of command that are necessary for those who uh, intend to, to order around others in logistical capitalism, as well as to be subject uh, to it themselves. And it's no longer enough merely to have uh, professional ethics in accounting, uh, but one must uh, range out into these various forms of uh, open access, um, uh, to use the, the popular term. Um, now, I don't suggest that other things have necessarily gone away. As we know, um, primitive accumulation is still with us, and certainly industrialization is still with us, in, at least in, in my neighborhoods. Um, but I do think that we are facing something quite new here in logistical capitalism, and that one of the reasons we can read its newness is the, the viciousness with which, for, for, you know, for a long time, but now with increased um, attention, uh, many communities are met who, who, who fail to provide this access, who fail to move in the right ways, um, who fail to let things pass through uh, from the perspective of logistical capitalism, but from the perspective of communities and peoples who are involved in these kinds of struggles uh, are, in fact, um, I think, showing us a way towards some sort of liberation um, from this, this logistical nightmare, um, as the popular term goes. So um, I'll, I'll end there because I understand we're trying to keep pretty strictly to time. And I've, I've gone pretty quickly over a lot of uh, material, and I'd be pleased to try to expand on anything that was, uh, was worth repeating. Thanks. I'd like to talk. Um, there's a lot of moving parts. <laughs> So I'm not quite sure where, where exactly to start, but uh, I really am just wondering if you could articulate more what the line is constituted by. Is it information? Is it, I mean, you, you're calling it logistics, but what constitutes Is it energy, money, mm -hmm. um, or information, or is it all of these things, or how can, is there a way we can, we can pin this down somehow? Yeah, I, would, um, I think I would say that the, the line is constituted by labor. Uh, so the line is constituted and reconstituted by us. What, what flows in that line and what we bring to that line in order to improve it, I think are all the things that you're mentioning. And this is sometimes understood today in national security discourse as critical infrastructure. You know, it's the, the sort of heart of the identifiable uh, lines moving through society. Um, so on the one hand, what, what we're seeing is something that's it's just a continuation. We're seeing an increased laboring of the, uh, the other circuits of, of, of production, as Marx would call it. So there's, there's more labor going on in circulation, more labor going on in, uh, in, in distribution, more labor going on in consumption and realization. Uh, but on the other hand, I think that we're also seeing something different going on in production, uh, which is why I think it's worth uh, beginning to raise the question about whether we uh, need to think of a, 
another way to talk about um, capitalism today. And what I, I didn't have time to go into, but maybe what I would partly uh, uh, suggest a notion of logistical capitalism is in opposition to is this idea that uh, we entered some era of immaterial labor in which um, we're going to be working creatively uh, and in which uh, the model that we should have in mind is the student, the artist, the academic who has no division between work and life, etc. This is all a very, and, and, and uh, if you were in Chris's paper, you heard him give a very nice anecdote about a Google official who didn't think this was the way things were going either. But independently of that, from a political and philosophical point of view as well, I think that that notion that um, exploitation is going to be subject-based um, you know, is, is a, it's always been and it remains a kind of elite notion, but I think it's also simply false. Logistics isn't really interested in our personalities. Um, and access precisely um, is about not giving a shit about your subjectivity. Um, so, uh, which is why resistance to access or liberation from access is equally about not giving a shit about your subjectivity, which is, would be, I wouldn't say my critique of Black Lives Matters, but why that's not the way that I would approach uh, thinking about black life as a force of liberation today. This is from Chris and Susan. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, that was really great. Um, I, and I really, I like your um, concept of logistical capitalism quite a bit. I was just wondering, if you, can you say more about the humanities in Singapore? Uh, sure. I'm not sure whether you're, and I, I, you're seeing it as a contradictory space of class struggle, or if it's just the space of domination, teaching logistical tactics to people who are going to go on to de deploy them. I actually, I was, I was quite struck by that comment that you quoted from the Google, um, the Google, was he director of research or? Uh, oh, Norvig. Norvig, yeah, because I think that's what they, I think that's what the government has in mind in Singapore. They have in mind that they want at least a percentage of their university population to be able to go into that, uh, that world that is creative with other creatives. Um, but they, I think, but this, this was also raised in your talk. I think you raised this in talk. But Singapore also is perfectly happy for everyone else just to be in logistical capitalism. You know, they, it, it suits them fine that, that most, most people aren't going to be creative and that there isn't going to be a struggle over their subjectivity at work, um, but rather that things are simply going to pass through them and if they don't offer access, you know, uh, they're, they're going to have trouble. Um, so I, I think that's their idea of the, of the humanities and that they, they want to train a small group of people to, to have that as part of their ability to establish a class relation with, with others um, who are going to be doing, um, just doing logistics. You don't see it internally conflictual at all, it's pretty much just... It's internally conflictual at the institutional level for sure because um, the second that they discover what the humanities actually is, <laughs> Right. Again, something that you've, you've spoken about for a long time, Chris, as soon as they really discover what it is, they discover that it's dangerous. Um, so, so for sure there's, I mean, I don't hold up, in the particular scenario we're talking about, I don't hold up a lot of hope that that danger is going to add up to very much, but it, it, it definitely is yet a, another, another proof that um, you, you, you have to be careful what you wish for um, when you're talking about the humanities. Two reflections, um, one actually on Singapore and some of the interviewing I'd done there. Um, the frustration for the officials fundamentally is that they can't sort that line out straight enough at the moment. Um, but one, it just occurred to me that um, the phenomenon of MOOCs, but not just MOOCs, the ways in which uh, the particularly publishing companies like McGraw, Hill and others um, are involved in the governance of universities, but what they are doing essentially in these arrangements is generating um, analytical da data. And I think the distraction with MOOCs is, at one level is we kind of see this as a new learning phenomenon. I actually see it, if you look at the back end of it, it's actually about how you, you sort that line out so that you have a very clear sense of the, the straightness. It's almost kind of main lining in, you know, between the learner and how the textbook producers and so on um, figure out right to to the uh, eyeball movement 
movements, what they concentrate on, how long they concentrate, and so on. Mm -hmm. So this is this is uh, this is where it's all going, and I think we get distracted by MOOCs as a different kind of phenomenon to what it is. Mm -hmm. I think that's absolutely right. I mean, the breaking down of the body, the breaking down of affect, et cetera, is part of what logistics does in order to get access, um, in order to speed things up, in order to find ways to improve things. And I think that the student experience, certainly at SMU, but I think in a lot of places, increasingly has to do with beginning to get comfortable uh, feeling like data, for instance. Um, already, as we know, students are are accustomed to instant access to information in, in ways that um, uh, also uh, very quickly bleed over into their demanding that from others. Um, and that's, I think, maybe part of the interesting class position of being students, especially at more elite universities like Auckland or SMU. Um, and Auckland's more elite still, I would say. Uh, so I think what's happening in terms of that, there's Althusser separates these two things, the skills that need to be reproduced and the domination. But, but today, the way logistics works, most definitely not through the subject, we see that these things get, get blended, that um, there are all kinds of ways in which it's sometimes hard to say whether someone um, is being prepared to command others uh, in, in logistical capitalism or is, or is simply uh, learning how to be more openly accessible. Um, you know, a good example of this uh, in a very you know concrete way is, is, are the, is uh, something like Alfred. Do you know what Alfred is? Um, Alfred is uh, this service that's really only possible with this kind of breakdown and opening up of the assembly line through society. And it's uh, essentially what Alfred is, is people who have no jobs who, who agree to be uh, just-in-time butlers for people who do have jobs. Um, and this works on the one hand because we, we, in places like the United States and Britain, we have this pulling away of a class that can uh, do this. But it also works because uh, people's lives become through, so scattered by be, trying to be uh, effective on, on this assembly line, to try to be continuously improving that, of course, they can't manage their own lives. And at the same time, the like, judicial capitalism pushes out anybody who hasn't figured out how to to, to, to offer an up access, and they become available to, to do this, uh, this kind of Alfred uh, Butler stuff. So just like the micro-tasking of, of the Mechanical Turk or something else, these are all sort of byproducts we can see that are flowing out of this, uh, this kind of ridiculous Kaizen in the social factory that you know, can't, can't possibly be answered um, and, and, and causes a kind of fracturing uh, of society. Last question, I think. Yeah, I think I don't need to like. Yeah, I've been wondering all along. I mean, I'm very sympathetic to this idea of you know, cognitive or physical capitalism, but if we're all workers, so if we're all getting exploited, who is the dominant class? Well, um, that's a, I mean, that's a nice question. And of course, there's a sociological way that that's looked at through things like Davos and things, right? Um, you know, but, but that doesn't interest me very much. Uh, what does interest me is, is the way that domination operates uh, when the people who are supposed to be able to consider themselves subjects are themselves broken apart by access and by logistics. So what I would say for you is what, to me, what's interesting right now is it's, that's a very difficult question. Uh, you know, it's that, I, I mean, I think this is the reason that the, you know, that we, we're seeing, you know, I wouldn't say it's a reason, but you know, part of, part of what's going on with, with the humanities is that they can't reconstitute the subject because society won't have it, you know? Um, so I think it's a, very, it's a very interesting moment for that. You know, Althusser is out of date in that sense, but, but I still want to talk about domination and the way it's produced in the university uh, because um, I think that, uh, you know, I think it's still a primary site for that uh, effort. It's just that it's no longer necessarily uh, distributed in bodies that in, in turn um, can think of themselves as individuals and as subjects in the way that it might previously have been. I realize there are a number of more questions, but I think we're going to need to wrap up questions on. So please join me thanking Stephen. Thank you.